Good evening, everyone. And a very warm welcome to this joint event between the Royal Society of Edinburgh and the Society of Antiquaries in Scotland. My name is Jocelyn Bell Burnell, and I'm the interim president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. It's very good to be talking, working with the Society of Antiquaries this evening, and you're very welcome to what's going to be an extremely interesting evening. I will hand over now to Professor Jerry Carruthers, University of Glasgow, to carry on and run the meeting. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I add uh, my welcome? I am Jerry Carruthers, Francis Hutchison Professor of Literature at the University of Glasgow, and I'm also a member of the Joint Advisory Committee at Abbotsford, assisting on research into Walter Scott's House and Library. Um, tonight's event is, um, as we've heard, jointly sponsored by the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Scotland's National Academy, and also by the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. Unfortunately, its president, Professor Ian Ralston, can't be with us, so I'm just going to say a few words about the Society, which is the oldest antiquarian society in Scotland, founded in 1780. It has late 18th century roots, um, as does the Royal Society of Edinburgh. The Society of Antiquaries of Scotland is an independent forum for the study conservation and enjoyment of Scotland's past. Today, it consists of over 2,700 members or fellows worldwide from a diverse range of backgrounds and ages who are interested in and inspired by the study of Scotland's past. Uh, antiquities that past fellows such as Walter Scott, a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, uh, fellows like Walter Scott collected and left the society material that was transferred to the nation in the mid 19th century and now forms the basis of the internationally important collections at the National Museums of Scotland. Tonight's event is part of Walter Scott 250, um, the celebration of Walter Scott's birth in 1771. Um, and the event will be recorded. Please feel free to type any questions that you may have into the chat. Our event will be around 10 minutes longer than originally advertised to give us a chance to have a bit of a discussion uh, with the panelists. As I say, put questions into the chat. We'll get through as many as we, we can. An exciting event coming up. We've got two speakers, uh, the first of whom I will introduce uh, now. Um, Dr. Ian Gordon Brown is former principal curator of manuscripts at the National Library of Scotland, former curator of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, past president of the Edinburgh Sir Walter Scott Club, and has a prodigious list of publications on antiquarianism in general, everything from Sir John Clark of Pennycook to Alan Ramsay to Walter Scott himself. And we're going to hear from Ian first um, on the topic of uh, Sir Walter Scott and the Scottish antiquarian tradition, Mr. Old Buck in context. Ian, over to you. In the autumn of the year 2000, the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland organised a conference on the theme of Abbotsford and Sir Walter Scott, the image and the influence. I edited the proceedings. Our concern was then with Abbotsford as a literary shrine, with Scott and material culture with Abbotsford as an early tourist destination and with the influence of Abbotsford on the history of architecture and design. Scott as an antiquary was never very far, could not be very far from our thoughts. As he himself said, his creation at Abbotsford was a flibberty gibbet of a house that would suit none but an antiquary. Scott lived in an antiquarian setting, which was paid for in greater part by the profits of his pen. The income of the world famous poet and novelist made possible the construction of that antiquarian ambience and that achievement in architecture and decoration, and also gave fulfillment to Scott's deep yearning for landed possession. Some, at least, of Scott's purchases of land resulted from a strongly antiquarian impetus to, to secure a numinous locality or ground where portable antiquities had been brought to light. 
Scott the antiquary, possessing the tastes and acquisitiveness that characterized the type both in real life and in the realm of the imagination, was, of course, author of a highly successful and enduringly popular novel, gently mocking that same type. It was entitled The Antiquary, and it was published in 1816. That novel, his third, was Scott's own favorite among his works. And for its leading character, Jonathan Oldbuck of Monk Barnes, the eponymous antiquary, Scott admitted a particular partiality. Oldbuck's interests mirrored some of Scott's own, but the Laird of Monk Barnes reflected to an even greater extent traits of antiquarian-minded men whom Scott in youth had known personally or by repute. The prime original was George Constable of Wallace Craigie, but characteristics and foibles of other men were incorporated in the mix so as to produce a sort of composite character of an archetypal 18th century antiquary. Scott was a longtime fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, established in 1780. He was briefly a vice president. In, 17, in 1800, he was also elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, established in 1783. Scott was to serve as the RSE's third president, from 1820 until his death in 1832. Both societies were products of the Enlightenment. In their fellowships, there was considerable overlap. The society shared two homes together for much of the 19th century, first in George Street, and then in the so-called Royal Institution building on the mound that we know as the Royal Scottish Academy. Ancient history and antiquarian studies fell to start with within the wide and universal concerns with general scientific and cultural knowledge comprehended by the RSE, which was divided into two classes, the scientific and the literary. I thought it might be interesting in the year in which we commemorate the 250th anniversary of Scott's birth to look, however briefly, at Scott the antiquary and at the antiquarian world which inspired him and of which he was himself a part and to do so by considering Scott's great character, Jonathan Oldbuck, in, so, in whom some of Scott's own whimsicalities are to be identified, and in whose activities and intellectual world are reflected those of many of the real antiquarian figures of 18th century Scotland. The founder of the Society of Antiquaries, David Stuart Erskine, 11th Earl of Beckham, died in 1829, the year in which Scott came to the end of his term as a vice president. Scott did not like the mercurial Bachan, being repelled, as were so many of his contemporaries, by Bachan's immense and absurd vanity and by his peculiarities of character. Scott called him a trumpery body. When Scott was once seriously ill, Bachan had forced his way into the sick room to assure the ailing monarch of literature that he, Bachan, would see that Scott had a funeral worthy of his national and international status. Not unnaturally, therefore, it gave Scott himself quiet pleasure to be able to attend Bachan's funeral. The coffin was laid in the grave at Dryborough Abbey, facing, as it happened, in the wrong direction. In the consternation, Scott muttered sotto voce that it was better to let the Earl lie as he was, because a man who'd been wrong-headed all his life would scarcely become right-headed after death, and advised the mourners not to bother to haul him out and turn him around. There is no question but that Scott was an antiquary through and through. As ballad collector, editor, literary scholar, student of language, and investigator of historical traditions, he embodies that side of the antiquarian mentality which concentrates on what Lord Bacon had categorized as the musty aspects of antiquarianism. As an accumulator of material objects, and a devotee of other antiquarian curiosities. And as a student of old buildings, Scott stands also as a prime exemplar of what Bachan branded the rusty branch of antiquarianism. As we'll see, Jonathan Oldbuck was both a rusty and a musty antiquary. Oldbuck is an amalgam, furthermore, of two strands of Scottish 18th century antiquarianism. He represents in some considerable measure the classical tradition. The exponents of this rejoiced in linking Scotland with the world of ancient Rome, 
and tried to do so by the scientific study of the remains of the past in the same general manner as they might study natural history. But Old Buck represents also, in a way, that kind of antiquarianism very much influenced by Scottish philosophical thought, a strand which was devoted to the study of man, language, and society, and which involved its exponents also in much speculation on the origins of epic poetry. Scott himself was not a classicist, except in his passing interest in the Roman remains of Scotland and the north of England. He displayed no overwhelming desire to follow the old custom of making a grand tour to Italy. When he did go to the Mediterranean in the last year of his life, he was more interested in natural phenomena, such as the volcanic eruption that formed the transient so-called Graham Island, on which he wrote a paper more whimsical by a very long measure than scientific for the Royal Society and sent back specimens to Edinburgh. But his companions in Naples and Rome could get him to take little interest in Greek and Roman antiquity. And when visiting the Societa Reale Borbonica, the National Academy of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, the president of the RSE, Scotland's National Academy, embarrassed himself by asking naively what might be all those red things on the wall. They were mural paintings from Pompeii. Abbotsford was Scott the Antiquary's antiquarian fastness. The house he built was a type site of the Scottish baronial revival. Abbotsford's was an iconic romantic interior, as we may define this kind of house where a collector lived surrounded by his museum of objects and in settings inspired by the architecture and decoration of the British past. The collection is a time capsule, highly significant for the development of national taste. The remarkable library is a precious and complete expression of a generalized antiquarian learning. As far as the ancient world went, Archibald Constable's magnificent gift of a set of Greek and Latin authors in 140 volumes would, Scott assured the donor, set me up in the line of classical antiquities. However, one suspects the fact that it looked good on the library shelves was as important as its contents. So it was too with Scott's superb scarlet Morocco bound set of Montfaucon's great L'Antiquité Expliquée et Représentée en Figure. His pleasure and pride in these tomes may be due more to the fact that they were the gift of King George IV than for any intrinsic merit the seminal work possessed as a thesaurus or paper museum of the material remains of antiquity as illustrative of classical literature. At Abbotsford, Scott's Romance of a House, his Conundrum Castle, man, house, and collections, and ethos were all united in one whole idea of antiquarianism, one amalgam of antiquarian consciousness. To his collection, more or less any old fragment of dubious antiquity might make a, a welcome addition, for given the right imagination and a suitable sensibility, each objet trouvé might become, as he once put it, to a hobby horsical antiquary, omen faustum felixque. As with Scott, so with Jonathan Oldbuck, who is as hobby horsical an antiquary as might be imagined. In the antiquary, fact and fiction coalesce. At the opening of the novel, we find Oldbuck buying a copy of Alexander Gordon's Itinerarium Septentrionale, published in 1726. Now, it's hardly surprising that Scott should make an 18th century antiquary want to have and to rely upon this important and influential, but not entirely reliable and highly prejudiced work. What is surprising is the fact that Old Buck should appear not to have owned a copy rather earlier in his antiquarian career. That is perhaps Scott's one mistake in expounding the Scottish antiquarian background in his wonderfully clever novel. It's also significant that Old Buck is made to rely on Gordon rather than on the magisterial and much more scholarly Britannia Romana by John Horsley. Old Buck thus appears the old fashioned amateur, depending upon sources which were less authoritative because they were less rigorously and methodologically analyzed. Gordon's book is moreover the more enduring. Gordon's book, I should say, 
is, however, the more endearing, not to say raffish. Sometimes it was also more explicit in conveying the actuality of what had been unearthed. I adduce the evidence of the illustration of the Roman phallic sculptured stone in Sir John Clarke's collection at Pennycook, as illustrated by Gordon on the left and by Horsley on the right. The urbane Gordon had been an opera singer in Italy and later a drawing master in London. Horsley was an earnest, non-juring North Country clergyman. The difference shows. At the opening of the novel, the elderly antiquary, Oldbuck, finds himself sharing a coach journey with Lovell, a young visitor to Eastern Scotland. Discovering Lovell to be both interested and reasonably knowledgeable, Oldbuck plunges into a sea of discussion concerning urns, vases, votive altars, Roman camps, and the rules of castrametation. Straight away, Oldbuck is established as one devoted to elucidating the period of the Roman occupation of Scotland on the basis of material evidence, this being used either to corroborate or to disprove the evidence of the literary or epigraphic sources. A mishap with a cast horseshoe allows the antiquary time to show Lovell a so-called Pict's camp or roundabout not far from the road. All Old Buck's predecessors and contemporaries would have done the same, though the banks and ditches might have implied a fortification belonging to Roman, Pict or Dane, as they would have seen them, according to the viewer's preference. Of any remoter prehistory, there was little of any concept. Old Buck would, one suspect, happily have believed wherever possible that such entrenchments were Roman, though whether the remains of one of the Castra Estiva or of the Castra Stativa, temporary marching camps or more permanent garrisons, is uncertain. Fieldwork and first-hand observations were the keys to success in antiquarian endeavour, in the study of castramatation, as elsewhere. Thus, Old Buck asserts, when he lambasts less assiduous antics, if they tain the pains to satisfy their own eyes instead of following each other's blind guidance. In addition to measuring overgrown entrenchments and drawing plans of ruined castles, Old Buck is a student of ancient inscriptions and a numismatist who would be inclined to write essays on medals in the proportion of 12 pages to each letter of the legend. He glories in ownership of a copper otho a Roman coin notorious as one frequently forged in collector's cabinets. He corresponds with fellow virtuosi of the day. Uh, like his genuine Scottish contemporaries, he has friends among English antiquarian circles, in his case with the Reverend Dr. Dryasdust of York, a man who kept his port in a cellar constructed partly of the Roman brick of ancient Eberacum that might once have held the vintages of the victors of the world. He knows European scholars, as did the actual Scottish antiquaries on whom Scott models his character. Old Buck has a friend in Dr. Heavystern of Holland, the real Sir John Clark of Pennycook, one of those antics of the generation or two preceding Scots, contributed his constantly revised essay on the Roman stylus to the great Thesaurus Antiquitatum of the Dutch classical scholars Grivius and Granovius. But not even Old Buck would have imagined what Clark thought about his Roman writing implements. One of these was quite evidently an Iron Age or Romano-British fibula. But Clark thought he used the pin of the brooch for writing on wax tablets, the butt end of the brooch for rubbing out, and that you held the bow of the brooch in the hand. An engraving showed one how to do it. Hobby horsical nonsense. Scott Burroughs and uses as a chapter epigraph to describe Old Buck in his study, or Sanctum Sanctorum, where even the undisturbed dust was to be valued for its own sake, burns his lines on Captain Francis Gross. He had a fouth of old knick-knackets, rusty iron caps and jingling jackets. Think of Scott's own cluttered armoury at Abbotsford, or his study in Castle Street. It could be monk barns. Think of representations of Scott at work among his curiosities. And remember that his own catalogue of his collection at Abbotsford was entitled Reliquiae Trotcosienses, or the Gabions 
of the late Jonathan Oldbuck Esquire. Fiction and fact are interchangeable. In the, fictionaries, in the fictional antiquaries den are books in plenty and vellum and parchment documents too, for he is an avid bibliophile. Nevertheless, the impression made on the visitor by the material remains of the past is the stronger, and the whole constitutes a mari magnum of miscellaneous trumpery. We now know that a then unused description of the study of John Clark of Eldin, a son of Sir John Clark, which occurs in the manuscript of Scott's Guy Mannering, that's the immediately preceding novel to the antiquary in the Waverley series, was rehearsed on this little later occasion and actually applied to Old Buck Sanctum. As the landlord of the Hawes Inn says, Old Buck rejoices in all world stories and tells a boot folk lang sign. Scott, the early collector of ballads and oral traditions, makes Monk Barnes an adherent to this strand of antiquarianism. Very telling is the episode when he goes to interrogate Elspeth Meikle Beckett in her cottage. He finds her chaunting forth an old ballad in a wild and doleful recitative. A diligent collector of these legendary scraps of ancient poetry, his foot refused to cross the threshold when his ear was thus arrested and his hand instinctively took pencil and memorandum book. It's a historical ballad, a genuine and doubted fragment of minstrelsy. Percy would admire its simplicity. Ritson could not impugn its authenticity. Old Buck's original purpose in visiting Old Elspeth is almost forgotten. When I read that passage, I think of the great Rayburn portrait of Scott at Hermitage Castle, lost in ballad thought and with pencil and notebook in hand. It matters not that individual supposed antiquities were wrongly interpreted. The mundane and the false might still become the valuable and the coveted in proportion to the level of the very desire for possession. Many a rare book could be acquired at the expense of a little tobacco or ale. Old Buck and his actual progenitors knew the pleasure of the antiquarian chase. These were what Old Buck calls the white moments of life. One thinks of how the real Sir John Clark acquired Roman inscribed stones from the Antonine Wall by means of drinking, flattery, and other methods. Old sculpture stones were useful gifts or bargaining counters, both in actuality and in fiction. They might be used to secure favours. In real life, this strategy was proposed by Professor Thomas Blackwell of Marshall College, Aberdeen, when seeking a piece of academic patronage through the agency of Clark as Baron of Exchequer, who might well be tempted by a Roman stone. In fiction, the magistrates of Fairport seek to bring a new municipal watercourse into the town through the policies of Monk Barnes, their suit being pressed by means of a proposed gift to Mr. Oldbuck of some medieval carved fragments just right for his garden. In Scott's own real life, the magistrates of Edinburgh gave him fragments of the demolished toll booth for reincorporation in the fabric of the developing Abbotsford. A great deal of the cumulative Scottish antiquarian tradition is epitomized in the famous episode of the Came of Kin Prunes. There, even the weed-grown banks and ditches of a modern sheepfold revealed to the would-be experienced but actually deluded antiquarian eye the remains of a Roman camp. But not just any Roman camp. This was none other than Agricola's camp before the Battle of Mons Gropius. So valuable was the site to him in both historical and emotional terms that Old Buck had bought the ground, otherwise agriculturally valueless for an unwisely excessive price. But then only he knew the real significance of the site and therefore its true value. It was ultimately a national concern, a telling phrase. Though they did not know it yet, Old Buck had spent his money in effect on behalf of the people of Scotland. Much of Scottish 18th century antiquarian endeavor could be told, called just that, a national concern. In the 18th century, evidence 
of Roman activity in Scotland was eagerly looked for as proof of two things. Roman effort at conquest and attempted subjection of the Caledonians in the name of civilization, and in consequence, evidence in another way of Caledonian greatness in inspiring such Roman effort in the first place, and ultimately in repelling Rome and thus preserving ancient freedoms, albeit at the expense of the blessings of civilization. The antiquaries whom Oldbuck adduces, if only to point up their topographical ignorance and lack of deductive capability, are the great names of the century past. The learned virtuoso Sir Robert Sybil, a treasury of knowledge, both historical and scientific, much of whose work appeared in Latin. The capricious Alexander Gordon, the pioneering English field archeologist, William Steeple, General William Roy, the great surveyor, map maker and topographer of Roman North Britain. None had recognized the true importance of Old Buck's expensively purchased camp. Scott might have cited those other Scottish military men and antiquarian enthusiasts, General Robert Melville and Captain Alexander Shand. And although Scott did not uh, allude to him in this scene, Sir John Clark is really the prime begetter of this hilarious episode as Scott well knew from family stories. Sir John had been discomfited at a supposed Roman praetorium in Dumfrieshire by the arrival of a local shepherd who declared that he himself had not long since built the would-be ancient earthwork with his flochter spade. In the antiquary, the comedy of mistaken readings and inscriptions, which were actually wholly bogus, rings entirely true. False etymology was an antiquarian heffalump trap. Old Buck fell right in. Further conclusions based on yet more dubious readings of inscriptions of very doubtful authenticity could only result in the addition of some more pages to his unfinished and long to remain unfinished essay on castrametation. Unfinished or interminable publication was itself an antiquarian trait. Scott was in a good position to parody Alexander Gordon's wishful reading of a disputed inscription because that very Roman stone from Cramond had ended up in the Advocates Library of which Scott himself had once been a curator. The entire Came of Kinprunes episode, corralling as it does so many of the hobby horses which pranced across the Scottish 18th century antiquarian landscape is brilliantly observed. What the contemporary topographer David McPherson branded as Agricola mania has never been better sent up and gently but tellingly mocked. Even contemporary Scottish antiquaries reckoned there was something peculiar about the Roman obsessions of their kind. In his Caledonia, George Chalmers discussed that thread of sophistry running through all Scottish antiquarian writings on the would-be site of Mons Gropius. In a little known and I think never quoted essay, the excursion published in his Attic Fragments of 1825, Robert Newdy tells us how he encountered a Strathmore laird who was fixated on locating the literal remains of Agricola. In an instance of Agricola mania carried to its extremity, this obsessive even believed that he had found a tumulus containing the Roman general's very bones. Naturally, there was an associated Roman camp with ramparts and ditches. Mewdy tells us that he instinctively thought of Scott's novel with its splendid scene of Oldbuck at the Cave of King Prunes. The Strathmore Laird was, like Oldbuck, much swayed by etymology, so much so that he alleged that a local man bearing the name of Miller owed his patronymic not to any corn-grinding past, but to the Latin for a soldier. He was descended from a Roman soldier, a Miles. In dealing with the written sources of history, Oldbuck is more circumspect. He shows himself less credulous than might be expected, and indeed as shrewder and more suspicious than he appears in the realm of field archaeology or in the study of material culture. But this does not mean that Oldbuck could not indulge in heated argument with Sir Arthur Warder, each man adducing in his support leading names in Scottish antiquarian thought. John Pinkerton and George Chalmers here on one side, 
Thomas Innes and Joseph Ritson there and the other, Henry Maul of Kelly, Sir Robert Sybil, Sandy Gordon, and a number of other fictitious scholars as well. James Macpherson and Ossian uh, are later brought into Old Buck's arguments as he appears hostile to such specious literary discoveries and to their proponents. But yet, for his own part, Old Buck is prepared to bamboozle his listeners with long disquisitions on etymological topics, which depend for their thrust upon knowledge of sources ranging from place names and language changes to early Scottish poetry and even botanical observation. When young Lovell is wet to the skin after his exertions to save Sir Arthur Warder and his daughter from the rising tide at Halkett Head, Old Buck offers him his nightgown and slippers with a half wry wish that thereby the younger man might catch the antiquarian fever as men do the plague by wearing infected garments, a contemporary residence for their, us perhaps. But Old Buck hopes Lovell might also acquire his own characteristic oratund diction peppered with liberally with Latin tags is entirely possible. Old Buck longs for Lovell to turn to antiquarian authorship. Some essays like his own, perhaps, published in the Gentleman's Magazine or the Antiquarian Repertory. How many 18th century antiquaries, such as Clark, his English friends, Roger and Samuel Gale, Sir James Fowles of Collington, Lord Bacon himself, were in Scott's mind here. Merely a modest list of slight publications, three to be precise, render Old Buck, in his own estimation, an author of experience and no apprentice in the mysteries of authorcraft. Yet at the same time, he is, as he says paradoxically, a total stranger to authorial vanity. That leads to Old Buck suggesting to Lovell a suitable subject for the younger man's pen. Eschewing the minutiae of antiquarian scholarship, Lovell should choose instead poetry. But even this is to be suffused with an antiquarian motif. He should think of an epic poem to be called the Caledoniad, the theme of which would be the battle between the Caledonians and the Romans. The subtitle would be Invasion Repelled. Lavell protests, but the invasion was not repelled. Old Buck counter slyly, you may defeat the Romans in spite of Tacitus. This and the succeeding pages constitutes brilliant stuff. Come in Alexander Gordon and John Clark. One wonders if Scott had actually read their yellowing manuscript correspondence on a visit to the Pinnacle House Charter Room. How often did the reckless Scottish nationalism of Gordon have to be reined in? How often did Clark procrastinate in publishing his lucubrations? Scott writes of Old Buck thus, like many other men who spend their lives in obscure literary research, he had a secret ambition to appear in print which was checked by cold fits of diffidence, fear of criticism, and habits of indolence and procrastination. This could, so, this could so easily be old Sir John. It's his character exactly. The company of a young man like Lovell, susceptible to or at least tolerant of the tastes of an older antiquarian-minded gentleman, was bound to please the latter. Old Buck's hot-headed and philistine army officer nephew Hector McIntyre, on the other hand, had no time for his uncle's fusty interests. These were dismissed as eternal harangues upon topics not worth the spark of a flint. His investigations about ancient pots and pans and tobacco stoppers past service. One thinks of Scott's own solace in what he called antiquarian old womanries, which he likened to a task such as knitting a stocking, chores which might divert the mind without occupying it. But antiquarian interests were also a mark of comfortable gullibility and complacency. A worn old bodle, a low-value Scottish bawbee, becomes a rare and valuable Roman coin. A modern ditch becomes an ancient camp. As Eddie Ochiltree says of a battered and quite ordinary snuff mole, I reckon you'll be going to mac an antiquate, as indeed in his imagination Old Buck has already done. An object called in the novel, the lachrymatory of Clochnaben, pride of Old Buck's cabinet and proof of the Roman presence beyond the Grampians, where they had left behind them traces of their arts and arms. How many antiquaries 
dearly wanted evidence of such endeavor is of course not Roman at all. Imagined by its owner to be a little vial used by some Roman widow to hold tears shed at a funeral on this northwest frontier of the empire is in fact suspiciously similar to modern day Eastern devices for cooling drinks, examples of which had found their way home in the kits of soldiers returning from service in India or Egypt. Captain McIntyre, whose dog Juno has broken Old Buck's pride and joy, the self-same lacrimatory, is able to make good his uncle's loss easily by offering him a pair of the ceramic utensils. Not only is Old Buck mollified, he's inspired to take up some new line of research, to trace the connection by nations in their uses, to trace the connection of nations by their usages and the similarity of the implements they enjoy had long been my favorite study. Everything that can illustrate such connections is most valuable to me. This is brilliant observation by Scott again. The shattered Roman lacrimatory is forgotten. We can see Mr. Oldbuck beginning to clasp at ethnography and to think of a whole new collecting field opening to him as more and more soldiers and travelers bring curiosities home from overseas. Old Buck's antiquarianism could run happily on and on in new directions in pursuit of new hobby horses. Walter Scott had drawn, drawn not only one of his finest characters and had mocked a vein in the human psyche, which was very dear to him and which continues to give his readers, especially those of us who are of an antiquarian turn of mind, instruction, pleasure and amusement. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ian. Um, a virtuoso performance indeed. Our second speaker is Kirsty Archer Thompson, uh, Kirsty's Collections and Interpretation Manager for the Abbotsford Trust, the independent charity responsible for managing the former home and estate of Sir Walter Scott. It's a Grade A listed house and designed landscape near Melrose in the Scottish Borders well worth a, a, a visit, it's open again. And uh, Kirsty oversees the collections, exhibitions, built and natural heritage of the site, incorporating curation, conservation and research alongside the daily management of the house and the visitor experience in Scott's self-styled Museum for Living In. And I might also mention that Kirsty's involved in the very excellent University of Aberdeen free online course, the MOOC, on Walter Scott, um, if tonight is, is, is whetting your appetite for more Walter Scott. Kirsty is going to speak for us tonight on chewing the cud of sweet and bitter fancy, navigating the unquiet mind and life philosophy of Walter Scott. Kirsty, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Jerry. Uh, good evening, everyone, and huge thanks to Dr. Ian Brown for his foray into one of my favourite Scott novels, definitely one of the most humorous. If you haven't read it, you absolutely should, and for showcasing such a, a vital aspect of Scott's life and cultural legacy. It will come as absolutely no surprise to anyone in this audience, given my job title, that I find Scott endlessly fascinating in both his breadth of interests and in his depth of character. And I think it's testament to him in his big anniversary year that my paper can take us off in, in such a different direction, but hopefully one that's equally interesting and, and fruitful for discussions at the end. Thank you, Jade. Next slide, please. Sorry, I've got a bit of a delay on that. There we go. Scott was a true polymath, even in the interdisciplinary mould of Enlightenment Edinburgh. He was as adept in matters of arboriculture and picturesque landscape design as he was in historical study. A man who excitedly sought out and bought in to the new technologies and innovations that were so much a feature of his era, at the same time as fighting to preserve history, memory and folk culture. And just uh, some of the images on the slide there to explain why they're there. The black and white photograph there is part of the original engine of the 1812 paddle steamer known as Comet, which is uh, one of the first such commercial ventures in Europe. And it sailed the Clyde between Glasgow and Greenock. And Scott was actually one of the, the very early passengers. He was really excited about this new technology. In a similar vein, in the bottom right-hand corner is, is a lovely etching of 
early gaslighting experiments on Pall Mall. This is a sort of 1807, 1808. And Scott would become so interested in the technology that Abbotsford is one of the first houses uh, in the world to be entirely lit by uh, gas lighting, oil gas at the time. And uh, the two gentlemen on the left hand side there towards the, the top left corner are the, the Brothers Grimm. And Scott had, you know, they were his continental contemporaries, they were correspondents, fellow philologists, and Scott had a number of, of letters back and forth between uh, Jacob Grimm and, and himself, all about those, those shared passions across international borders. And the, the Royal Scottish Forestry Society still carries a motto that's taken from Scott's novel, The Heart of Midlothian, which sounds an awful lot better in a, a dialect that's not mine, but is, um, you know, basically be always sticking in a tree because it will be growing when you're sleeping. And uh, that in some ways um, pays homage to Scott's amazing work as a tree planter. And we'll come on to that in some quite surprising ways uh, at the end of this presentation. Thank you. Next slide, please. Whenever visitors come to Scott's Borders home at Abbotsford, I hope they leave with just some sense of how many things Scott was all at the same time, and that sometimes these things might seem incongruous with one another. He was a romantic, yet a gadget man, a trendsetter, an authority on ancient tradition, a philanthropist, yet a collector, and a writer and a tree planter. Showcasing a writer's home to the public well requires a certain degree of alchemy. You want visitors to feel that the historical owner is just around the corner, tantalizingly out of reach. There are some visitors who come to Abbotsford to connect with the writer they have admired or studied, but the majority are looking for something more intimate, domestic and accessible. They may have heard of Scott and feel something of the weight of achievements and influence behind his name, or they may not have done. Either way, they're coming to see a home of somebody, and that means stripping away some of the outer layers of a public persona that can feel intimidating, particularly with regards to Scott's immense literary output or his major and very public achievements. Next slide, please. When you do that, what you are left with is a man who was in himself extraordinary, but also someone who had an extraordinary relationship with his home. Scott had poured so much of himself into its very fabric that a symbiotic relationship was established between the two. Abbotsford was a sanctuary, a muse, a seductress, and in some ways a downfall all at once. It was perhaps the greatest love of his life. Thank you, Jade. When you walk Scott's halls, or indeed his Regency gardens, and pay attention to the details, you realize that this was a man both conflicted and complex as so many great minds are. The key difference and the marvel with Scott is that we have such a fascinating window on his inner workings through the thousands of private letters he penned and the journal manuscript he's left to us, documenting the final turbulent years of his life. There is no greater gift for bringing his home and the man to life. And just to give you an idea of, of some of that complexity, once you look a little deeper, um, the image on the slide there is some of the sculptures from our South Court Sculpture Gallery, which is effectively mimicking that tradition of the Elizabethan Long Gallery, but it incorporates sculptures from all over the world. And they connect, um, they bridge continents, uh, historical periods, different peoples, but all of them explore ideas of, of allegiance, power and faith and what motivates people and how societies and peoples are structured. And it's a really, really interesting to juxtapose these different ideas and to see them laid out in the way they are in the Abbotsford Garden. So it's all designed to, to make you think. Thank you, Jade. Chewing the cud of sweet and bitter fancy is a phrase sometimes attributed to Walter Scott but it is in fact from As You Like It, Act 4, Scene 3, the first Shakespeare play Scott ever saw performed on the stage when he was just a young boy, here in this 18th century theatre on Orchard Street in Bath. Thank you, next slide. It is a phrase he uses elements of or alludes to regularly in his epigraphs and in his private writing. 
In some ways, a quote like this is a mantra for a life such as Scott's, a life defined by the skill, promise and necessity of harnessing imaginative powers, but one that acknowledges that those same powers that can mine literary gold can also stoke a furnace of inner turmoil full of what ifs and smarting old wounds. This quote also speaks to us of a writer who found himself forced to make literature a crutch rather than a staff, as Scott fought to stave off financial collapse in the final years of his life, writing night and day to pay off eye-watering debts that had stacked up at his door. And when you're reading Scott's letters, what strikes you most is there's this stark difference between his public and his private persona, or perhaps more accurately, personas, depending on the recipient. As you might expect, long-standing friends are permitted more of a glimpse beneath the mask than others. He offers a real spectrum of versions of himself, both public and private. Thank you. To some extent, we all do this, but with Scott, it's even more complex because he wrote anonymously for so many years, giving birth to a dizzying array of fictional authors and editors in a maze of literary smoke and mirrors part marketing ploy, part game, part self-preservation. So will the real Walter Scott please stand up? It is of course part of my role to interpret Scott and the legacy he's left to us in ways that flex according to the interests of our audiences and the contemporary points of reference they have to call upon. Thank you. And in considering the unquiet mind of Scott, and those are his words, not mine, I have to say that on more than one occasion in recent years, I've been struck by the comparisons with some of our modern day comedians, artists and performers who have hidden their struggles with mental health issues behind the stage curtain and in some sad cases have paid the ultimate price. Scott regularly refers to himself in these performative terms. He was very theatrical at heart, but behind the scenes he had his own private battles with anxiety and depression or the fiend, as he would most often refer to these disruptions in his mental health. And that's something I, I want to return to in due course. Thank you. This might need a double click, this one. Thank you. The things that I, and I think a fair proportion of Abbotsford's visitors, most want to know about Walter Scott are intensely personal. How did he feel about that meteoric trajectory of his life, astonishing as it was? What kept him awake at night? How did he deal with growing old or losing the people he loved? What was his private creed and life philosophy? And how did that impact upon the advice he gave to others? Was he a happy man? Now, I'm not proposing we can comprehensively answer some of these fundamental questions in a short paper or indeed in a lifetime, but we can certainly uncover some clues. Thank you, Jade. In the early 1820s, just as Scott was in the thick of crafting his fantasy home and estate at Abbotsford, he seemed untouchable. He was a literary superstar with the most astonishing cultural capital. And from amongst the committee tasked with superintending King George IV's visit to Scotland in 1822, Scott emerged as a key player and master of ceremonies, welcoming the monarch to Scotland on behalf of Scotland as a kind of poet king. But Scott always acknowledged how precarious his popularity was, given it was a matter of taste. Knowing this, he chose to ride the tide of public favour as hard as he could whilst his stock was high with his capricious readers. He described this favour as credit, which is of course something finite that necessitates a day of reckoning. The abiding sensation I get on reading the raft of letters he's left to us is that Scott remained bemused and pleasantly surprised by his own success. And it isn't until the very end of his life that his tone becomes more despondent and he starts to real, he, sorry, reveal he is ashamed of his latest work, but he has no choice but to, quote, eat his pudding and hold his tongue, i.e. publish. And that in itself must have been a difficult cross to bear. Literary hubris was certainly never a feature of Scott's mindset. In fact, the story goes, if we are to believe his friend and printer, James Ballantyne, that Scott had actually warned his eldest daughter, Sophia, off reading his best-selling poem, The Lady of the Lake, because, quote, there was nothing so bad for young people as reading bad poetry. Although writing enhanced his income exponentially, specifically financing the Abbotsford project, it did not constitute the entirety of his financial security. He had his legal appointments for that, 
and that made the shifting sands of public opinion easier to navigate. Undoubtedly, there was still a lot to lose given the expenses and the lifestyle that the Scott family had become accustomed to, but there wasn't everything, at least at this point in time. Thank you. On the slide, you can see uh, just a few snippets of advice Scott gives to others who are looking to carve out literary careers for themselves. And this second quote is particularly nice. Um, there's some, some themes here that we'll return to. I made a virtue of necessity and was in due time rewarded by finding that I could very well unite my love of letters with my professional duty. And that set at ease on the score of providing for my family, I had more respectability in the eyes of the public more freedom of intellect and sunshine of mind than I could have with all the uncertainty, dependence and precarious provision, which are the lot of men of literature who have neither profession nor private fortune. And there's a few ideas there, things like ease, freedom and particularly sunshine of mind that we can contrast with some of his later comments as his relationship with literature and why he chooses to write begin to change. Thank you. Next slide. I absolutely love this quote. And I think anyone that's ever tried to write anything or do anything creative will uh, definitely resonate with it. When I am once set a going, I roll like a stone downhill, but the first two or three turns are incredibly unpleasant. Here, here. So what of this authorial or creative process? Anybody that produces any form of art will tell you that there are no guarantees on how easy this may be on any given day. And Scott struggled with things that all seem very familiar, an inability to focus, unwelcome physical, mental or emotional intrusions, loneliness, a punishing work schedule, the inevitable writer's block. One of the interesting things here is that Scott is so vocal about his coping mechanisms in his journal entries. When you look at this diary, you realise that the vision that we have of a writer locked away in his study in silence fixed singularly on his magnum opus, just as we see in countless images of Scott in art, is not quite the way of it, or at least not the way of it for significant portions of the time. Scott was an enviable multitasker, preferring to work through concepts, plots and ideas, at the same time as doing several other things, usually reading, walking for miles and miles, or tending to his woodland plantations at Abbotsford. And the image he pegs his methodology on is as old as the hills, rooted in folklore and mythology, the storyteller at the spinning wheel, how the mechanical can enable the creative in the right sort of mind. Thank you, Jade. And this is uh, just one example of that in the folklore tradition. This is the uh, Norse goddess Frigor or Frika at her spinning wheel. Um, she's weaving the clouds of the heavens, but also the, the story, the, the destiny and the fate of humankind. Um, and this was such a popular image that, in fact, Frigor's spinning wheel was an alternative name for the constellation of stars we now know as Orion's belt. Thank you, Jade. Uh, just a couple of clicks on the next one, please. There are some fantastic quotes here and I'll just um, just pick out a couple. It's interesting that Ian actually mentioned um, the knitting a stocking uh, motif from the antiquary and this this comes in in some of those quotes as well. There must be two currents of ideas going on in my mind at the same time or perhaps the slighter occupation serves like a woman's wheel or stocking to ballast the mind as it were by preventing the thoughts from wandering and so give deeper current the power to flow undisturbed. I always laugh when I hear people say, do one thing at once. I've done a dozen things at once all of my life. I wish I functioned like that, I have to say. Um, and this, this third one down is also really lovely. Women, it is said, go mad much seldomer than men. I fancy if this be true, it is in some degree owing to the little manual works in which they are constantly employed which regulate in some degree the current of ideas as the pendulum regulates the motion of the timepiece. I do not know if this is sense or nonsense, but I am sensible that if I were in solitary confinement without either the power of taking exercise or employing myself in study, six months would make me a madman or an idiot. And uh, there's knitting uh, that motif again in, in the final quote there. Now, in that quote, he says, 
thoughts that are chafing and boiling, that final one right at the bottom. And I found that a really interesting phrase. That says to me a feeling of restriction, feeling trapped, drowning in some kind of intensity or, or mental anguish. And this pain is understandable. At the tail end of 1825, as the stock market crashed and the fallout ricocheted through the economy, Scott found himself on the road to ruin, personally liable for £126,000, now equating to well over £10 million. He was just 54 years old, and in a matter of a few short months, he would lose the Edinburgh home he'd owned since 1802, his beloved wife of 29 years, and he would almost lose Abbotsford too. Thank you. This second quote is particularly uh, prescient. For myself, the magic wand of the unknown is shivered in his grasp. And of course, Scott was known for many years um, as the great unknown. He must henceforth be termed the too well known. The feast of fancy is over with the feeling of independence. I can no longer have the delight of waking in the morning with bright ideas in my mind. Think of the, the sunshine of the mind that he was talking about earlier, and then haste to commit them to paper and count them monthly, the means of planting such groves and purchasing such wastes, replacing my dreams of fiction by other prospective visions of walks by fountain heads and pathless groves, places which pale passion loves. And in that end, he, he's talking about why he writes, which is to, to create and to nurture his environment at Abbotsford. And Scott had a philosophy of sorts when he encountered such pain, both courtesy of external forces and from those within. On the one hand, he was a romantic, receptive, self-reflective, and on the other, a man of a rational scientific persuasion who self-prescribes his tried and tested cures for the emotional imbalances he observes. In his journal and in some of his more candid letters, this battleground between feeling and control is a well-trodden field and not one solely confined to the years following the financial crash. Thank you, next slide. And um, that second quote there brings us home, a touch of the morbus eruditorum to which I am as little subject as most folks and have it less now than when young. It is a tremor of the heart, the pulsation of which becomes painfully sensible, a disposition to causeless alarm, much lassitude, a decay of vigor of mind and activity of intellect, the reins feel weary and painful and the mind is apt to receive and encourage gloomy apprehensions and causeless fears. Fighting with this fiend is not always the best way to conquer him. I have always found exercise and open air better than reasoning. And these kind of nervous distempers were far from swept under the carpet in Georgian society. An enhanced awareness of self and emotionality was often considered a hallmark of good breeding. Just think of Henry Mackenzie's The Man of Feeling. The idea of this kind of self-expression and sentimentalism being incongruous with a construct of masculinity is largely a later invention. So Scott's determination to control this darker force within him, whether it's named a, a fiend, a reaver, or a black dog, which are all terms he uses, isn't an attempt to preserve appearances for a reputational sake. It's actually more of a personal coping strategy. And tackling the sensation of a mistiness or a muddiness of mind that can signal a whole host of known mental health and well-being compromises and catastrophes from grief to depression to burnout is one of many contemporary topics on which Scott feels fresh and relatable 200 years on. And it's easy to forget that this holistic approach to regaining or reaching that elusive goal of wellness was fairly extraordinary thinking in the Regency period. Thank you. Scott could have actually written the NHS Five Tenets of Wellbeing, although he might not have used such concise language to do so. Look at some of them. Connection with others, physical activity and fresh air, learning and discovery, giving and helping others, and mindfulness and grounding yourself in any given moment, noticing the things around you. Scott knew he needed all of this, and he tells us so. The next slide shows his own version of these five ways to wellbeing. Exercise is very necessary to me. No mind to die of my armchair. Every step in knowledge properly considered and well used is a step in happiness. My wish to do good to the poor and indeed um, the Abbotsford project is always offered opportunities um, for, for the local community to benefit. 
And this, this last one is brilliant. And I particularly um, seized upon this during uh, the pandemic or the heights of the pandemic and lockdown. I found it really resonated with, with me. I would have you use early hours, light and nutritious diet, frequent but short exercise, amusing reading, that is reading which amuses you without racking your brain too hard. Cultivate the garden, look to the plantations, play with your little ones, get more of you like it. We are not cabbages and therefore it is hoped we may meet though we are planted in different creeks of the same garden. That idea of connectivity and, and togetherness and companionship is crucially important. Thank you, next slide. One of Scott's phrases, and it's rather irresistible as you would expect with someone as famous for coining expressions, is a quest for an elasticity of mind. And I should say this was something I have a former colleague to thank for first noticing. And she was right, it is a special word, given it's a word of science made for describing sinews, tendons, solids and gases. In Scott's era, etymologically, it wasn't thought to have entered more figurative usage, but if anyone in the audience knows of any other literary examples, I'd love to hear them. And a phrase like this feels so modern as we increasingly occupy ourselves with the quest to remain mentally supple. Indeed, The Elastic Mind has been the title or subtitle of a number of books on neurological development, health and well-being published just over the last 20 years. Scott's solutions for attempting to banish the mully grubs of the mind, which is a wonderful 16th century word for the blues that Scott likes to use, were actively promoted later in the century as Victorian physicians published household self-help guides on matters of physical and psychological health, particularly given the increase in industrialization and urban living. According to Dr. Beeches and his guide of 1861, and just think back to uh, Scott's tenets of well-being just a slide before, one should be, Amused with a variety of scenery, take freely of exercise in the open air, riding, walking, gardening, farming. He should peruse interesting books and converse with cheerful friends and above all be located in pleasant scenery, the country air and the country diet. I don't think any of us would take issue with any of this wisdom today. And it is interesting that above all else, access to nature is the key, the foundations for everything that follows. And for Scott, one of the most cutting things about old age and growing infirmity was it prevented him from engaging in physical activity and getting outdoors, both of which he deemed essential for mental and emotional stability, as we've already seen. It is this aspect of his personal writing that is the most poignant and touching of all, given that these struggles come to all of us in the end. Thank you, next slide. And these are perhaps uh, as, as um, hard hitting as you'll get in, in the journal and in the letters. The second one, um, monthly that old age is clawing me with its clutch. It is no great matter, there's no pain. And yet to find oneself grow every day weaker is dispiriting enough. And he describes himself there as a, an old cabinet in the corner that could not bear much shaking about. I fear when death comes, we shall be unwilling for all that to part with our bundle of sticks. And this last one, the brightest ray of hope is the chance that I may get some mechanical aid. So he's hoping he might be able to get something to mount a pony with ease, to walk without torture. This would indeed be almost a restoration of my youth, at least of a green old age full of enjoyment. The shutting one out from the face of living nature is almost worth worse than sudden death. And look at those organic metaphors, bundle of sticks, green old age, is shutting out the face of living nature. And consider that Scott was a real father of the forest. He actually estimated he planted almost a million trees here at Abbotsford. It's extraordinary transformation of the landscape. The seeds he planted with friends, family and estate staff were his offspring. And he spoke of them with a deep affection rarely shown for his literary works. Thank you, Jade, next slide. This link between humans and trees is one that Scott returns to repeatedly in dark times, and it seems to bring him great solace and joy. People may need nourishment, space and light to become mighty oaks, but young saplings needed mentoring and nurture to start them on their journey and to encourage them to thrive. The trials and tribulations of despair, loss and poor health blast a person like a storm around a lone tree. 
and when life's day is near the gloaming, only those bundle of sticks remain. And yet the lifespan of a tree can bridge many generations of the same family. They're the longest living life form we know of. And thanks to the scientific breakthroughs of the late 18th century, Scott and his contemporaries knew that plants and trees give us the oxygen we need to breathe, the building blocks for that green and elastic mind. Trees have witnessed history unfold beneath their boughs and they will still stand long after we've gone. Aspects of Scott's faith and belief systems may be difficult to penetrate. There's some fantastic and tantalizing glimpses of him considering the prospect of infinite worlds and other times, exploring those ideas of the universe in his letters. But we can say with some confidence that he did feel a deep spiritual connection to trees. Thank you, next slide. If these glimpses into Scott's inner world can tell us anything, it's that we must nurture ourselves, seek out the sunshine of companionship and philanthropy, consider the balance in all things, in both our own personal microcosms and in the macrocosm of the natural world, which we're utterly dependent on. It's a lesson very much for our times. And I just want to, to end with this lovely quote, which I think sums up everything that Scott feels about nurturing a landscape and caring for an environment and, and what mental benefit that might have. I saunter about from nine in the morning till five at night with a plaid around my shoulders and an immensely large bloodhound at my heels and I stick in sprigs which are to become trees when I shall have no eyes to look at them. Somebody will look at them however though I question if they will have the same pleasure in gazing on the full-grown oaks that I have had in nursing the saplings. There is something in these operations that connects us more with futurity than anything which we can undertake, for we are sowing that posterity may reap. Thank you very much, Kirsty. That was a quite delightful portrait of Scott's energy and indeed vulnerability. We have time for a few questions uh, via the question and answer function um, for our two speakers. And there's a question from Claire Elliott asking about Abbotsford. Maybe this is one for you, Kirsty. On average, how much time was Scott able to spend there per year? And did his family ever live there? Yeah, so uh, roughly speaking, I mean, Scott first purchases um, Abbotsford in 1811, moves there with his family in 1812. And at that time, it's designed to be a, a country retreat. So it's, it's not the principal residence, but they were spending a good four or five, maybe maybe six months of the year if they could claw it. Scott obviously had his legal position in Edinburgh, so he had to follow the court schedule as to when he needed to be in the capital. But they would certainly be at Abbotsford over the, the late summer period and uh, certainly around Christmas time, usually. But when the Edinburgh home is sold in 1826, uh, following the financial crisis, Ab Abbotsford becomes Scott's sole residence. And it stayed in family hands down the generations right up until 2004. So it's run by a charity now, an independent charity, but we still have a direct descendant sitting on the board, which is a lovely position to be in. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, Ian, perhaps one for you from Monica Kendall. Monica asks about the antiquary and uh, says, Samuel Rush Merrick advised Sir Walter Scott. Was he genuine in his advice? Could you respond to that? You're on mute, Ian. Sir so Samuel Rush Merrick was certainly a very genuine antiquary. I don't know whether he was genuine in his advice, but what I do think was very genuine is that Scott and Merrick, if I remember rightly, were of mutual assistance to each other. I think from memory that Scott gave Merrick at least one Andrea Ferrara sword, that famous sword, the iconic sword of the Scottish clansman, and certainly Merrick was instrumental in, in helping Scott to acquire arms and armour for his expanding collection, and I also think, going back the other way, that Scott was instrumental in trying to encourage Merrick to write his great book, which came out uh, 18... 23, was it 1824, uh, cri critical, critical inquiry into 
ancient arm or something like that it was called so they, they they were of mutual support and also of course part of this mix was the remarkable daniel terry the man who was so greatly responsible for helping scott to with the decoration of abbotsford terry you remember that man who loved scott so much that he actually taught himself to write almost exactly like scott it's i, I don't mean as a as a writer as a novelist as a poet but the physical business of writing it's quite extraordinary if you see a daniel telly letter you would think it was written by Scott. He actually came to be able to imitate Scott's hand in a quite uncanny way. Even after many years of reading Scott's hand, it was very difficult to tell Merrick, uh, to tell um, Terry and, and Scott apart. But I think to try and answer the, the question from Monica there, I would say that Scott and Merrick were of mutual support. And yes, I don't think there was any game about this they wanted to help each other expand their collections and i think the most interesting thing between the two was the story of the andrea ferrara the great uh, iconic sword of uh, the the jacobite warrior italian sword of course uh, the andrea ferrara mentioned in several of scott's novels and i've just been talking about the antiquary and i think i'm right in saying that and Andrea Ferrara was one of the several swords hanging on the walls of Monk Barnes that Old Buck thought he might arm himself with when he thought he might have to go out and repel the, the French invasion that was expected. And uh, one of the swords he thought about was an Andrea Ferrara, but if I'm right in saying he found it had no, it had no hilt, so he couldn't use it, he had to use something else. Thanks, Ian. Um, again, Kirsty, for your good self, uh, Francesca de Martina asks about uh, you mentioning one of Scott's works that he was not pleased with, but mm. had to publish. Why did he have to? Yeah, well, well, the simple answer is, you know, following the, the financial crash, as I said, Scott's relationship with literature changed. It was no longer a, a hobby horse in the same way as, as Ian was was delightfully entertaining us with, with Scott's um enthusiasms for collecting, actually writing became the means by which he started to repay his creditors these vast sums of money. So Scott had always written quickly, he'd always churned out an awful, awful lot in record time, but he was now forced to, you know, really write against the clock to try and, um, uh, you know, depreciate that, that huge amount of money that he owed. Jerry, you might be able to remember the work that this refers to. I just know that that quote is very late. It's about 1830. Um, you, might, you might know which novel it actually relates to. It escapes me, I'm afraid. I can certainly find out and, and share afterwards if that's useful to the, to the questioner. Yes, if you could. I can't exactly remember, mm. but I know also the, the, the quotation that you, mm. that you, that you mentioned. Um, uh, again, Kirsty, Ian Mitchell uh, mentions your reference to Scott's interest in other worlds. Could mm. you elaborate? Uh, yeah, this is, this is wonderful. And I, I wish I could elaborate more. It's, it's something I was wondering if somebody would ask about because it absolutely fascinates me. This is, there's a, there's a little hint, a sort of sprinkling of references in Scott's letters very soon after the death of his wife, Charlotte, where he's obviously having a bit of a, a crisis of faith, or at least thinking about how to process that loss, that immense loss. And he, when he's thinking about whether he will be reunited with Charlotte, it's not, the, the terminology and the sort of language he uses isn't necessarily that rooted sort of simply in, in Christian faith. It, it also brings in aspects of of science as well, which is particularly interesting, obviously, given the, the societies that we're, we're speaking to today. So he he's considering things on a, on a kind of universe and, and other possibilities and almost parallel dimensions and things. He's wondering if in the infinite reaches of the universe, there might be a way and a place for them to be reunited again. And it's it's beautiful stuff. But he never really elaborates because obviously these are these are hints in his journal. He's not writing for anybody but himself. He doesn't expect this to be published or explained in any way. But I find that really, really interesting. Um, it would be wonderful to know what was going on in his head. But he's certainly trying to square science and religion in some quite interesting ways. There's also some great references to him thinking about 
the atomic structure of the human being and how as time goes on, you know, we're effectively reborn again, our cells and the, on an atomic level, we're reborn again, so we're not the same people. And he's considering these interesting ideas, which I find fascinating. Thanks, Kirsty. Ian, uh, Malcolm raises a very interesting issue, um, Burton here, in which Scott was involved in the proceedings involving the Royal Society of Edinburgh, etc. Uh, Malcolm asks, is there any mention of William Hare's confession in Scott's journal, as Hare's confession mysteriously disappeared from the public record, and Scott was only was one of only two people to see the confession firsthand? Do you know anything about that? I don't, because I haven't got the journal to hand, and therefore I can't look it up. <laughs> uh, he, the questioner could probably do that himself. But there is a very interesting Royal Society connection here that I can think of just from the back of my mind. Scott, as president, tried to prevent Robert Knox, the anatomist, from speaking to a Royal Society meeting. In fact, did do that because he didn't think it was right that somebody who had benefited from these crimes should be given the forum that a Royal Society meeting would uh, offer him, nor the credibility that being heard by that august body would offer Dr. Knox. So Scott, I, I, again, I'd have to look it up, but there is a very nice thing. I think in the journal or in one of the letters of the time, Kirsty, you're not, you, you probably know it, mm. uh, where he does say that he doesn't think it's right to give this man airtime. The other thing to just mention to, to add on to Ian's answer is that um, the academic Caroline McCracken Flesh has done a lot of work on Scott's interest in, in the Burke and Hare story and in the case. So certainly that's a, that's an avenue to look up um, papers and associated reading if you're interested in exploring that more. Yes, and just a wee add on to that, one of the things that we'll have in our exhibition in the autumn of Walter Scott's popular culture materials at Abbotsford will be mm -hmm. taken from his extensive collection of Burke and Hare materials. Um, as Kirsty says, Caroline McCracken Fletcher has done a lot there. There's even more to be delved into there. Um, we have a question here. Do either of the speakers know anything about Scott's relationship with John James Edmonston of Newton of Dune? Ian? I don't recognise oh. the name, but I'm constantly discovering things about Scott I don't know. That's why it's it's such a joy to, to work on him. I'm afraid I don't. Right, I have the index to the letters beside me here, so <laughs> I'll just look that up, talk among yourselves. <laughs> no, the name is not familiar to me. Uh, Edmonston of Newton, I think of in a connection with David Hume, actually, but Edinburgh, that's a different thing. What we can also do um, is make sure all speakers have got access to our, our research inquiries, all speakers, sorry, all, all attendees have got access to our research inquiries email address so that anything else anyone wants to follow up or ask about with a little bit more time to hand, we can look into. John yeah. James Edmonston of Newton uh, gets four, five, five entries in Corson's index to Grierson's edition of the letters. Uh, so not a not a major correspondent, or not somebody who is frequently referred to by Scott in correspondence with others, but he's somebody on how should we put it the Scott periphery. Thanks, Ian. And sort of along the lines of what Kirsty was speaking about a moment again, Swapan Chatterjee asks, would the slides of both speakers? Uh, be posted and available to the attendees for further enjoyment later. Well, tonight will be recorded and I'm sure we'll be able to, to make it available uh, to people. A few other questions coming in, but I think um, we've just run out of time, uh, more or less. So I think we had better bring things to a conclusion. Thank you all for attending this joint event tonight by the two societies. Thank you very much to our speakers who have given us compelling portraits, I think, of Scott, the Imagineer, the human being, um, the novelist, the antiquarian. And this event is, is, is one of many events as part of Scott 250. So do look out, please, for the other events that form that festival of Walter Scott, if you like, through the rest of this year and indeed into next. Um, 
thank you also this evening to Nazia Khan, to Jade Dent and Andrea Kajewski um, of the two societies for their assistance. And um, recording, I'm sure, will be made available in future. Look out for more details of that. And it only remains for me to wish you all a very good evening. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night.